Of course the system fails to pick up the game as per usual. Oh man. That sucks a lot. It always does this every single time without fail. Oh, there we go. Back up. I just saw no. Okay, I'm going to have to Google that. Once we're done, once we're done here today, then I am definitely going to work tirelessly without and put everything in my life on halt until I can figure out a way for Streamlabs to stop forgetting that I have my Minecraft window open whenever I switch to another thing like the wait screen um, and just keep it open at all time. That's it. No delay. No nothing. It's just, oh man, I despise this thing. But we are live. We are nonetheless live for another episode of Upon This Block, where we will be continuing our conversion of the evil, evil world of Sodom Babel, Egypt, and building beautiful churches while we're at it. So, um, what did I put in this description again uh, for the goals for today? It's kind of, I'll try to keep them general because uh, anything too specific might be unachievable. But uh, so. Add some details to the church frame, yep, and begin prep for going into the nether and talking about some reading and study I've been doing. Oh yes, that's right, it is going to be a good one today. They are all good ones. Sometimes I don't get why you, why YouTubers or streamers or whoever, they like to say, oh, today's episode is going to be a good one. It's like, what, are, are, are your other ones not that good? Are, like, have you been deliberately giving people trash until this episode when you decided like, oh yeah, this one's going to be a good one. So it's, 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 kind, of, it's kind of an instinctual thing that a lot of people... A lot of streamers and all that will will, uh, will say just just kind of out of a whim and not exactly understand the implications of it. So uh, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm all of my upon this block episodes, in my opinion, are good ones, uh, and this one will be no exception. But uh, perhaps some in other interesting stuff that doesn't normally happen will happen with this one, such as preparing for the Nether. So hello everybody, hello all three people watching right now, which which might include me because I have it on my phone below me, so I can actually see the live chat. Nonetheless, I hope more people uh, end up pouring in, um, despite the fact that this is not the usual day for upon this block, since uh, yesterday I could not be in the house, because uh, there were house inspections happening, or rather people coming in to view the house, uh, since it's up for sale. Um, yeah, so I wasn't able to do an episode yesterday, so I had to move to the same time today, so apologies for that, but I do hope people are still able to join in nonetheless. So, let us load up the world. Yes, I know what I'm doing. I'm using an experimental Minecraft snapshot. one18 is around the corner too. Um, so I'm wondering, once it comes out, if I'll either immediately call it for this pilot season, call it a season, or if I'll just complete whatever I want to complete and then, um, and then go to 1.18. I think that's what I'll do. I think I'm going to first complete what I'm doing here. So at least the church, the good old beautiful church out there, um, which is yeah, kind of a basic structure. So I, I, I guess I probably shouldn't say that the frame is complete per se, uh, but we got something there. Andrew, my man, my favorite man right now. How are you? My first, my only and first ever patron, um, or at least in this season. Cause technically I had two other patrons like a couple of years ago when I started it, but I immediately told them to stop contribute, contributing because I wasn't able to content but uh for this real launch of the other paul's patreon you are my first and mate you are awesome you are a truly awesome guy so i'm gonna shout you out my man andrew bailey um for being my first patron that is awesome that is really really cool and i do hope everyone else watching considers becoming a patron for uh to uh, help uh, support this support what i'm doing uh, uh help me make an income of it so i can make it consistent regular high quality content and uh yeah yeah, and you can even get some goodies out of it too, uh, depending on the tea you go with. So, um, it's actually becoming nighttime right now, so let us go to sleep. So good, excited for this episode. Glad you're excited, my man. I am glad you are excited. And I uh, hope more people begin pouring in. For those already here, I do encourage you, send this off, send this stream off to any other friends who you think might be interested in uh, Minecraft and uh, Bible, uh, all together in one. So we can uh, get so we can get a nice uh, nice turn up today, God willing. Even though it is not my normal time, so I don't expect to have the uh, absolutely groundbreaking numbers of twelve viewers, <laughs> twelve concurrent viewers. But uh, yeah, God willing, God willing, we'll get some we'll get some more people today. Actually, you know what? I kind of forgot to do something. 
I shall just pause for one second as I, excuse me, as I spread the link to my other um, socials. So let us go to the glorious Gab. And then one more on Facebook for good measure. Throw in a sunglasses emoji, because those always look fantastic. They look truly, truly manly. <laughs> there you are. Bang, post. Andrew asks, what are you sipping on today? I am sipping on some nice Earl Grey uh, from Diplomat. That's my, that's my concoction for today. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. I've got a got a pretty pretty large tea collection in my house. It's uh it's kind of it's kind of mandatory for us. It's, that's kind of what we kind of what we have to do. So I'm thinking for this church. I'm thinking either at the back or the front. I'm thinking most likely the front because that's what I've seen more often. That will have a bit of a we'll have a bit of a bell tower up there. So. I'm not sure if it'll be the most accurate, aesthetically speaking. You know, actually, no, I need to pull up the reference images I've got for Antique Stone Church. I need to pull up these reference images. Yeah, they're, they're actually relatively simple, yeah. Really, really simple, actually, yeah. Interesting, and they got some archways and all that. They're pretty, yeah. Yeah, it just depends on... Depends on really what you choose to go with, but it looks like, that does look like the back slash the front. So I'm thinking, I'll have like a little bell tower going up here. Um, and I don't want to have it in the way of the windows because the windows are, they're pretty much the very front where like the pastor slash priest uh, does his thing in the service. So that's, that's going to just remain as that. Actually, no, I remember one of my, one of my mates, I've got to send, I've got to send a link to him. There we go. Sorry. All right. Last time that's happening. No more link sharing. I'll just uh, have faith that people will find it and uh, we'll come to watch. So perhaps I'll have the bell tower come out. Perhaps I'll come in here a little bit. And then, yeah. So let's get some of that cobble. Actually, no, I'll leave it. Oh, do we have any more cobble? Actually, I think we do. Okay, not really, but I can outline the bell tower. So, how do I want to go about it? I think maybe yay wide. One, two, three, yep. Get rid of that. Yeah, this should do well. Yeah, okay, so I'm thinking this can be the outline for the bell tower. And how it'll work is that there'll be a central spire kind of going up like that. And I think I'll make that out of stone gates. Um, and that, yeah. Oh, sorry, stone walls. <laughs> stone wall. Stone wall Jackson, absolute legend of history. Um, so it'll go up and then there'll be a spiral staircase going around it like that. And let us put a bed back down because we don't want to lose that. We want to make sure there's always a bed spawn. So that's what I'm thinking I'll do. I think I'll actually make some stone walls right now. Although then again, I am out of cobblestone. So that means back to the mines. Yay. Back to the mines. Let's go. All right. There's actually quite a few caves here that I don't think I've explored yet. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. And that down there is the marker I placed for the cavern. So I can know where it is. <clears throat> well, yes, either way, for those here, hello. How your day's been? I hope you guys are going quite well. Please do tell us. Let's get that nice, lively atmosphere happening, as is characteristic of these streams. So right now, I'm going to head to the cavern. And yeah, 
get to the cabin, get some cobble, maybe some more resources. Then again, do I really need to, I don't, I don't really need to go down there. Just for, I'm just getting cobble. That's it. So, so I'll probably just go down one of these caves that I haven't looked at yet. Misty Mountains, good song that. One of my favourites, even though it's ironically from the Hobbit trilogy, which I don't particularly like. But even then, the Misty Mountains, oof, the rendition they did for that movie was spectacular. Mm. Oh yeah. Alright, let's get some cobble from here, why not? So I guess while we're waiting for people, I'll talk about some reading and study I've been doing. So I've just recently started. Oh, come on! I want more people to want more people to pour in. Only two people watching right now, really. One of which might actually. I don't think it would count me. So maybe there is two people. Ah, two dungeons deep and caverns old. So I might as well give my rendition. Far over the misty mountains cold. To dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to find our long forgotten gold. I don't know the rest. Of the chorus. <laughs> and that's where I'll end it. Jeremiah, yes, I am the second one. Hello, Jeremiah, how are you, my man? Hope you're having a spectacular day as well. Alright, just grabbing just grab cobble for now. Get as much as I can so I can build the church tower. Andrew says, oh yes, most excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The challenge, of course, is the deeps, is the depths of the vocals, but uh, I think I, I think I can do that quite well. But uh, yeah, as for reading and study, I've been doing. I've um, started this thing. I wanted to do for a while, actually, um, but I've only really started it now. Um, basically, every month I find a new historical or theological, but mostly historical topic, and I spend the entire month dedicated on that reading up on it, studying on it. And this is independent from channel content, by the way. Channel content would still be distinct, although I will almost certainly be incorporating that into channel content. So whatever I'm studying, I can make like an educational video on it, uh, stuff particularly uh, aimed at schools and classrooms and all that. So this month I've started with a very interesting historical uh, period, uh, historical kind of controversy known as the quarter decimal controversy. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys may or may not have actually heard of it, but actually I'll get some more stone before I head off. But the quarter decimal controversy, basically um, the controversy that in the late, yes, the late second century uh, AD, although it really, although kind of stuff that kind of underlie, underlied it, um, there was some interaction on it even in the mid uh, to early uh, second century, so it's a very it's one of the oldest controversies of the of the church. Um, but it came to a head in the second century when um, basically bunches of local councils, which is basically how the the, the church governed itself once upon a time, uh, bunches and bunches of local councils all gathered and agreed that the Lord's Day um, ought to be celebrated on this certain day. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that I forget exactly what one they're talking about. Um, but it's on a specific Sunday. Now, all of them agree with that. So the churches at Rome, um, the churches in Gaul, um, even a bunch of the churches in the East, like Alexandria, they all they all agreed with that. Um, but but the churches at Asia Minor dissented from that, and that was because, as they claim, 
that actually they celebrate the passion of the Lord. They celebrate Easter. So that's what, that's what it's about. It's about celebration of Easter, the date of uh, Easter. Um, they celebrate it on, according to the Jewish calendar, on the 14th of Nisan, which was a different date to what the rest of the churches agreed. Uh, now, rather than, uh, there's, there's a recorded interaction between one of the earliest bishops of Rome, Anicetus, and Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. So, a not so, ins- a not so insignificant figure, all right? Um, they both disagreed on when to celebrate the Passover as well. Anicetus celebrated it on the way that the, the vast majority of the church later on would. Um, but Polycarp celebrated it on the 14th of Nisan. Um, but nonetheless, they both agreed to toleration. They both said, okay, okay, that's the tradition you've been handled, handed. Uh, you can celebrate that and we'll celebrate it this way. That was, that was peace for it. Um, but later on, the churches at large all gathered and said, no, we're all going to agree to this day. Um, but the churches at Asia Minor um, still said, no, we're, we, we've received it to celebrate on this time. So we're not going to dissent from that tradition. Um now, the rest of the churches, it doesn't appear that the rest of the churches um, were too massively fussed about that. They were, they were simply going to um, be regulating themselves, as was typical of the early church, the local congregations, local areas, local dioceses, if you, if you will, even though diocese is a bit, is a bit anachronistic. Um, they, they're all about self-regulation and otherwise leaving the regulation of other churches um, to them. So somewhat a degree of autonomy. On the other hand, there was the likes of the Bishop of Rome, Victor, who's often called Pope Victor, but I also would argue that such concepts like a Pope uh, is anachronistic for the second century, which of course any Catholic viewers might be going, Ree! at my suggestion of this, but just hang on with it, just, just hold on in there. Um, this Bishop of Rome uh, was furious, uh, Pope uh, Bishop Victor, or Pope, I was calling Pope Victor just to make it easy. And... He basically sent a letter condemning uh, the churches in Asia Minor, and actually, well, he sent he sent letters to across the across the world, according to Eusebius, uh, who records this entire event, um, saying that the churches in Asia Minor are cut off from communion. So he straight up att- attempted to excommunicate Asia Minor, um, which is in the west of Turkey. He straight up tried to excommunicate them from the communion of the church. Uh, because they had a different date of Easter, which they claim to have received um, as apostolic tradition, uh, in particular from John and uh, in his gospel as well. And uh, now, now here's the here's the cool thing, right? This and this controversy does have big implications, in my opinion, for our arguments for an early papacy. Because what happens next? is not what would be expected if there was anything close to a Vatican I conception of, uh, of, the, of the Bishop of Rome in the early church. Sorry, hang on, just checking something to make sure everything's running smoothly. Just trying to make sure, yep, cool, all good. Anyway, um, the response of the rest of the church to what Pope Victor did is not what you would expect um, if there was anything like a Catholic, a modern Catholic understanding of the Bishop of Rome. That being that the... Almost the entire church, except for Asia Minor, agreed with Victor that the that they would celebrate the the Lord's Day on the day that they specified, rather than the day that Asia Minor does. Um, so, n- in normal circumstances, they'd all be like, "Yep, cool. They're they're dissenting. They're dissenting from the faith. Um, yep, cool. Go ahead and excommunicate them, Pope Victor. They've dissented on a on a on a very serious matter of faith." So I don't know. I don't know why I'm going there. Um, so yeah, all good. Go, go excommunicate them. And of course they wouldn't have any say in the matter otherwise, uh, because the Pope, that's, that's the Pope's exclusive prerogative. If he chooses to excommunicate someone, you can't exactly just say, oh no, Pope, you're wrong for doing that. Cause that's him ex- exercising his, his holy office, really. His, uh, his, his infallibility, even if that's not the exact precise terminology. Hello, Pilgrim. How are you? I hope you're having a blessed day or evening. Um, but yeah, rather than all saying, yeah, let's excommunicate him, all the churches in Eusebius, in Eusebius' own words, sharply admonished him not to do that, not to cut off the communion uh, with Asia Minor. Eusebius says that this was basically the unanimous response to Victor from the church that agreed with him, from all the churches that agreed with him on the date of Easter, that they admonished him not to do that. And uh, Eusebius even partially quotes a letter from Irenaeus himself, actually, Irenaeus of Leon. Um, Bishop of Leon, 
uh, who headed who headed the local council in uh, in Gaul on this very issue, and who well nonetheless uh, agreed with Victor's opinion on the date of Easter. Um, so uh, where was I? Was my thought at? So they so they all admonished him for attempting to break communion with Asia Minor just because of the different tradition they they received, which was very fascinating. Um, and even and even then we can even see. Um, the letter of uh, the guy who, according to Eusebius, re represented... Oh my gosh, I need a new pickaxe. Who represented the churches at Asia Minor in this controversy to the rest of the church. And that was a man by the name of Polycrates, um, who was a bishop. And uh, Eusebius quotes a big, big chunk of his letter, which has some very, very fascinating historical information, which I can maybe go into detail another time. But... What Polycrates ends up trying to argue is that this is a tradition we've received, and he lists name after name after name of people in his area in Asia Minor uh, who all followed the 14th and Nisan date. And he includes John himself, the, John the, Apostle, the disciple John himself, um, as part of this tradition uh, as of those who held the 14th and Nisan. And he basically ends up giving a quip that, so uh, that, uh, do I have the book with me? I do, but I'll, I'll, get, it. I'll get it later. Um, but he basically says to, he says to Pope, he's saying this, this is a letter to the Bishop, the Bishop of Rome, right? Pope, Pope Victor. And he ends up saying, um, because of this, to paraphrase, because of the tradition we received and he quotes Acts 529, we must obey God rather than men. In fact, you know what? Give me literally two seconds. I'm going to get the quotation right now from my copy of Eusebius. It's actually really, really fascinating because that is not language you say if, uh, if, if the belief of the church is that the Bishop of Rome is the Vicar of Christ. That is not what you say to the Vicar of Christ. You don't call him a mere man and contrast him with God. Um, okay, Polycrates. So here I've got my edition of Eusebius right here. And he quotes... Yes, here it is. Um, so he has a big... Big section, quotes a massive section of Polycrates' letter to Victor, um, stating that uh, our that our people have all followed the 14th Nisan date, um, that it's not right to force us to not follow that. Um, and he ends with this, uh, blah, blah, blah. I, Polycrates, who am the least of all you, according to the tradition of my relatives, some of whom I have, uh, some of whom I have followed. Uh, for there were, and well, he's basically saying, I, Polycrates, I, I follow this tradition after the, after the naming of everyone else, he names himself. I follow this tradition. Uh, for there were seven, my relatives, bishops, and I am the eighth. Uh, so seven of his relatives were bishops and he's the eighth one of his relatives. And my relatives always observed the day when the people, the Jews threw away the leaven. I, therefore, brethren, am now 65 years in the Lord, who, having conferred with the bishop, bishops throughout the, the brethren throughout the world, uh, and having studied the whole of the sacred scriptures, am not alarmed at those things with which I am threatened to intimidate me. For they who are greater than I have said we ought to obey God rather than men. That is not something... Okay, this is, again, in Catholic theology, this is the rightful power of the Pope to excommunicate those who refuse to follow his, well, decrees on matters of faith and morals, which according to Catholic apologists, they'll say that's what he was doing here, that he himself made the decision we celebrate Easter on this day. And the wider church agreed with that. The vast majority of the church agreed with them on that. But then if we're expected to believe that this was church, that this was simply apostolic doctrine, that the Bishop of Rome is the is the supreme, is has primacy over the whole of the church, how on earth could Polycrates in his right mind at all say what he said there? That he is going to obey God rather than men, despite the fact that Victor is supposed to be the vicar of Christ and that he did everything according to his rightful power, according to Roman Catholics. Simply does not make sense. On top of the fact that the rest of the church, according to Eusebius, admonished, which is a negative thing, admonished, warned against, uh, uh, strongly strongly spoke against Victor for trying to excommunicate Asian minor because of a diverse practice they have, which basically is, which is basically a universal, don if we don't believe that, that that's, a, that's how it happened. But that's basically a denial of the idea that the Pope is the guardian, is the guardian of tradition, the infallible guardian of tradition. It simply does not make sense under that. Of course, 
there's many, many ways that you can you can jump through hoops uh, as a Roman Catholic apologist to say that, oh, well, he wasn't exercising this technical power, blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's just silly because once you look at the forest through the trees, this attitude, all right, ignoring technicality, this attitude of how the church responded to Victor is... So that, that you can't do that as a Roman Catholic, all right? If you're a faithful Roman Catholic, that as a bishop, a Roman Catholic bishop, you could not do that. No way. No way you could act like that. Um, in this specific scenario, when you even believe that the Pope is in the right. Anyway, anyway. Um, Pilgrim says, as an Orthodox catechumen, I really despise RC apologists using quotes indicating papal primacy as proof of papal supremacy. Early Christians never rejected papal primacy. Uh, problem is papal supremacy. Mm, I would even... I, I myself, with looking at the evidence, uh, would dispute even the idea of papal primacy. Because I know I know there's a distinction, but I believe there... I, I don't... I, I, I would dispute that even there. Because um, one thing to... Because I... It, it, how, how would I explain it? Just the entire attitude of how the church functions here does not suggest... Like, obviously, Rome is clearly... Rome clearly has a special place, but... It's, especially if you read how Irenaeus puts it, it's one of circumstance, not because of a special holy prerogative. Um, Rome is the central city of the empire. It was preached to by two apostles, which is huge, very big. Um, so it's very reliable and it has that, so it has a circumstantial primacy in that respect, but I don't believe there is a, an actual, um, how would I say, a set in stone primacy for Rome, even in the earliest centuries of the church. So I, I personally wouldn't grant that, but either way, either way. Jeremiah says, well, I never heard about all this. Thanks for the info. All good. Um, if you want to read Eusebius of Caesarea, so early 4th century, very, very early, um, his historical account of the court of Deciman fallacy, uh, fallacy controversy, um, you will want to go to... Uh, so here's church history. I'll type this in the chat. Church history, uh, chap uh, book 5, Chapters 23 to 25. That's where you want to go to. So I'll, I'll type that. I'll type that. No, stop it. I'll type it now. Why not? Why not? Church history, or rather ecclesiastical history, because I'm a fancy boy. Ecclesiastical history, book 5, 23. What did I say again? Did I say 23 to 24 or 25? Um, yep, 25, 23 to 25. And that's his Decimen controversy. Ah, come on, type it. But yes, that's his, uh, that's his account of it. Um, and he cites a, no, a small number of sources for that. Um, which is actually quite significant because normally, fun fact, and this is a this is a, this ought to make the uh, atheist apologists go re. But uh, ancient historians, even the most reliable ones, the vast, vast, vast majority of the time, did not directly quote or cite their sources. Um, they would occasionally bring them up, but uh, vast majority of the time in their accounts, they wouldn't. So there you go. Um, so the fact that Eusebius is he's, he's he, he quotes and cites sources everywhere. He's he's extremely unique among historians in that respect, ancient historians. Anyway, let's get back to building the church. But yeah, that's, um, anyway, to circle it back, um, Fingo, I, um, that's, so that's what I'm doing. I'm studying this month. I'm focusing on the quarter decimal uh, controversy and I'll probably make an educational video of it. Um, so it'll probably be the first among many of uh, educational classroom tailored uh, videos, which I'll make and uh, usable for students um, in secondary schools. So like in my in Australia, that will be grade seven to 12. And even in college, university, uh, I wanna make videos that are very well tailored for all those. So the quarter decimal controversy will be one of the first. Pilgrim says, when will you get back to making videos mocking progressive Christians? Um, honestly, when there's something relevant, because I don't wanna make videos just for the just because I want to. I want to make things that are like timely, things that are useful. Um, there may be a thing or two coming up where it might be used, where I might find myself, uh, where I might find it useful to address uh, progressive cringe. I just don't see anything massive right now. Probably the biggest thing at the moment would be critical race theory, although 
tons of other Christian content makers who've read far more into it than I have already made videos ad nauseum on it. So I don't really need, I don't really feel that I could contribute much more to that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I might, when something comes up, I'll, I'll, when something relevant does come up, I will do it. Actually, there is the 19, what's the, the 1948 or 19, I think it's 1948 movie. Um, which is basically a, a, cons a, do a documentary. I think you might have seen. I don't know if you guys might have seen it, but there was a trailer that dropped through it a while ago. Basically, trying to be a documentary that sh that like investigates how the word homosexual was first put into English Bible, starting with the RSV translation. Um, basically, tracing back or who were the actors in this, and who was this guy who expressed dissent, but he was ignored in the in the translation committee, and uh, basically trying to make out this this massive evil conspiracy uh, that it was just that they were just conspired to add homosexual but it was unjustified because bloody bloody blah, blah, blah so if that comes out I do want to do a live reaction to that um, live reaction and or perhaps a structured edited response as well so that would be that would be uh, uh, the, the closest idea I'd have to a coming progressive response otherwise I just don't see the need right now um, yes that's how you make them alright and some stairs perfection But yeah, it is kind of funny. But I don't know. I mean, even if it's not exactly timely, it is funny. Those the I I will I will pat myself on the back and say my response to the progressives are sharp and very funny. So maybe I will. Maybe I will just to, just to add to it. Even if it's not like the most necessary thing to be talking about right now. Maybe I will find another popular progressive cringe tard video and uh, and then give a response to that. Eh, gonna be a bit of a floating staircase, but I don't mind. <laughs> and don't know why. Oops. So cool. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna work. I just need to put the other stairs, make more stairs, bunch more stairs. And a bunch more gates. <clears throat> um so yeah, quarter decimal controversy, big reading on that. But also now recently um, got this big book I ordered um, called Lex Rex, or as as far as my Latin knowledge goes, Law is King. Although they they put it here, the Law and the King. I don't know. Oh, if Rutherford did put a comma there, then I guess that makes sense. Um, yeah, but anyway, it's a seventeenth century, seventeenth or sixteenth. I'm not sure. Um, but basically, one of the foundational. Uh, basically, one of the foundational. How would I say it? Um, texts of well, one of the one of the one of the biggest biggest uh, treat uh, texts from uh, post Reformation, uh, in particular Presbyterian um, scholars, uh, part slash pastors. So this is by this book is by Samuel Rutherford, uh, Scottish uh, Reform theologian and pastor. Basically, his big treatise on the proper role of government. And refuting the then popular Roman Catholic uh, conception of the divine right of kings, um, and then also uh, basically laying the groundwork of what is appropriate uh, resistance to tyranny in the Christian faith. Um, to what extent may tyranny to to what at what point is it appropriate to resist uh, an evil government? Um, yeah, so that so that's going to be it's going to be a very very critical text that I appeal to. Um, it's very, very critical text I'm appealing to in my video. And yeah, it'll be very helpful in defining those biblical boundaries. Because just looking at it, it's, it's, it's over 700 pages long. It is huge. Uh, and the guy was clearly very well read. He cites, um, he cites like texts, he cites ancient texts, including the scriptures in original languages. So Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. So very, very well read. Um, and from the glimpses I've, t from the little skimming I've done so far of it, it's very, very thorough. So he's going to be a good source for me um, being able to define 
uh, my argument um, for the proper role of the state according to the scriptures and uh, and thus refuting the claims of Christian statists who are just like, oh, we've got to submit to the government at all times, no matter what it does, just because we're Romans 13 and all that, not realizing that it actually sets the limits of what government's conduct is and we are only to submit insofar as it is carrying out that conduct. So, yeah, that's going to be a core cool argument. Very, very core cool argument in my video. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I can leave those as is. Uh, Jeremy says, what do you think about the 14th Nissan BDW? I mean, would it be okay if we all celebrate on 14th Nissan? I mean, we get the date right, but the day is not the same. But now we have Easter Sunday, day correct, date not the same. I mean, I, my response would be the same as the early church. Exercise Christian charity, allow people to celebrate according to the tradition they've received. I think, um, as far as I'm aware, um, it may involve confusion of what dates uh, that, that there may be imprecision on the part of the synoptic gospels, uh, whereas John is more specific. Um, and so as far, as far as I'm aware, their dates actually do line up. It's just that the synoptics are not as precise and all that. Um, I'm, 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 it's been a while since I've looked at it, so I'm not... Don't take me at my word there. Um, but even granting that the dates are... Even granting the dates are different, um, I'd just say exercise Christian charity. That's the response of the early church, and I personally think that was uh, that's a responsible uh, take as well. Um, yeah, celebrate it according to... Uh, yeah, according to the tradition that you that you receive. According to... Or, and in our case in particular, um, according to what you find is the more more reliable uh, more reliable date. If you think it's the 14th of Nissan, fantastic. If you think it's the uh, sun, the common Sunday as we know it, fantastic. Go for that. Um, yeah, yeah. It's Christ It's a Christian charity. So I, I personally haven't investigated the date myself. That might make another video that I could do. Um, but yeah. So as as I might come to one way or another, and thus I would say it is better uh, to celebrate on this day because there's better evidence for it. But even even then, even if I did come out with that, I'd say nonetheless, if someone is convinced, uh, if someone is convicted to celebrate on this day, okay, that's that's some Christian charity. This is a, um, it does appear that the, the early church considered this a Romans 14 type of issue. Oh, okay, not quite because, well, the vast majority of the church did say we celebrate on this day, we affirm that, we decree that for ourselves. But then the Asian minor said, no, no, we've got a different tradition. We're celebrating on this day. Um, but the early church was like, I guess it was kind of a Romans 14, 14 issue. Romans 14 saying that you don't judge another, you don't judge another servant of God for their personal disciplines, to paraphrase it. Um, but I guess it kind of is Romans 14, only on an ecclesiastical level where someone says, okay, our church, we're celebrating it like this, but this church, they're going to do it like that. We'll respect that. We'll leave that between them and God. So I guess somewhat of a Romans 14 issue. Somewhat. Um, yeah. So that's that would be my response. I'd just say, do what you're most convinced of. Pilgrim says, you were Pentecostal, right? I am Pentecostal, present tense, although with uh, very strongly reformed leanings otherwise, particularly on soteriology. I, of course, don't follow John Calvin's cessationism, um, among other things. But other than that, I'm, uh, yeah, I am quite convincingly reformed. Oh, that's actually kind of... Oh. oh, I actually quite like that, yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That, that is awesome. Sweet. So it's not as steep. Uh, Jeremiah, does Asia Minor still celebrate in 14th Nissan? I don't think so. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, so the, the most relevant people to ask for that would be, well, churches in that area, in uh, modern day Turkey. <laughs> Turkey. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if... Um, I wonder if the... If the Syriac churches, I wonder if they would do the same. I'm not sure. Someone who has more experience there would have to tell me if they celebrate according to that or if they went along with what the wider church does. Pilgrim says, Reformed? That's sad. You're sad. You're going Orthodox? Bro, that's sad. <laughs> I love you, man. I love you, but <laughs> you're sad. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's so easy. It's so easy. If someone, if someone wants to say, ooh, you're... Ew, your denomination X, that's 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 cringe or whatever. I'm just like, it's so easy to get a no you, to just get a no you. <laughs> you're, you're reformed, that's sad, no you. 
<laughs> That's my attitude. Oh man. Oh, this is looking it's looking not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. Progress could be a bit better, a bit more decisive. I just haven't had the consideration all the time that points to really get a decisive plan of what the church would be. I think I might do that um, after this after this episode. I might actually start formulating a proper plan, church plan. Um, yeah, so that I can know exactly what it's going to look like and just do that and not have to dilly-dally. But this doesn't look too bad. This uh, spiral staircase leading into the uh, into the bell tower. I think it looks not too shabby myself. Let's make a few more stairs. Um, yeah. And a few more gates. Actually, no, we've got enough gates. And then all I need to do after that is to make a bell. Uh, worst case scenario, I can take the village bell, although I probably don't want to in case there's a villager raid at some point. Um, yeah. Anyway, I asked that a while ago, but no one really responded. How's your days been? Let's let's let's, let's talk our days. How, have our days been good? Are we tired or whatever? Let's 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 get that happening. How, how have you all been these days? Oop. Hang on, am I supposed to do it that way? I don't know if I am. Don't no. I think I think I am at some point. And I'll fill that in later. Fill that in later. Um. Is this a good height for the bell tower? No, I need to go a little bit higher. <laughs> Jeremiah says, lots of university homework. Oh, bruh, bruh, I sympathize. Huge sympathize from me, bruh. I'm in a, I'm in a masters of teaching, which means a ton Oh, assignments. Tons and tons of them. Most of which, in my opinion, don't help me one diddly squat with actually getting better as a teacher. The vast, vast, vast majority of positive learning I've had as a, as a, in order to get better as a teacher has been when I actually teach. When I've had my teaching practicals in schools. I've had two of them so far. The amount of learning in just one for... In just the amount, the amount that you learn in just one four-week teaching stint um, eclipses everything you learn in one year of uni. In my humble opinion, like all the wisdom I got of teaching practice is just price absolutely priceless uh, that I've gotten from these pracs. Um, so yeah, I'm as you can probably tell, I'm not particularly a fan of the uni system. <laughs> Jeremiah says, particularly my fault since I listen to Christian vids and debates, I get distracted halfway plus the home. Oh man, I sympathize too. <laughs> I always tell myself, I'm just going to play this in the background and I'll do my work while I do it. And I'll just listen to the thing and I never actually do the work. Because of course, I mean, you're getting a second source of stimuli that you have to focus on, on top of actual uni work that does require focus uh, while you're doing it. So it... So really, as hard as it is for me, I've got to stop just listening to stuff while I do my uni work. I can reward myself afterwards, but while I do it, I I should not be listening to stuff. Andrew says, very good day. I ran the lyrics computer in a tech booth for a worship event at my local church this morning and again in the afternoon. Very, very nice, man. Very, very nice. So you're like, are you like the sound guy at your church? The, uh, the infamous sound guy. For, for whom all blame is laid upon. Are you the are you the sacrificial lamb of the church uh, upon whom all blame is laid whenever there's one little blip in the sound and everything goes wrong? <laughs> oh, darn, I think. I can't put roofs up here. Mm. Darn, these are going to have to remain open. Well, that sucks. Unless... So the problem I'm facing is that I can't complete the floor here because otherwise if I do that... Oh, uh, no, it works for this. But then if I do like that, we can't walk across... Well, can't walk back down or up anymore. Um, so a big chunk of the floor is exposed. I think... Good idea. What could I do? Oh, 
I'm genuinely not sure what to do now. I'm genuinely not sure. Increase the size, make it go outwards. That's, I, I, I was thinking that too, but, but the big, big problem with that, well, I mean, just it's, it's an aesthetic problem. These church towers, they don't go outwards like that. They never do that. Otherwise, it looks like a fort. Um, so this is a this is a church. So I don't. I, I want to avoid that. The best thing I can think of is to have stairs go up along this part of the wall and then onto a more complete platform just above. But that could be a bit of an aesthetic nightmare as well. So I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um. Right side though, we've got a bell tower. Hey, we've got a bell tower. I'm happy. I mean, oh. Then again, there's not really much purpose for actually walking around on the tower. So I mean, I guess I could just I could just leave it as is. Yeah. I mean, I'll just have the I'll just have the bell suspended, like right right where I am, a little bit above here. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I could do that. And uh, these these fence gates, I guess, can be the starting of the. <clears throat> Of the proper roof suspension. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's good enough for now. That's good enough for now. Uh, Jeremiah says trap doors for floor. Eh. Too... Eh. Too, too much effort for too little game. I mean, it doesn't matter anyway. It's not like you don't... I'm not exactly staying on top of that tower. You just go up there, ring the bell, come back down. What's the time? Nine forty. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. Now I'm gonna think of the interior here. I'm not exactly sure how they do it in, in the old stone Celtic churches. I haven't seen the layout, except for maybe in that movie. Ah uh, man, that that movie which is kind of like a spiritual successor to um, to Braveheart and it starred. Uh, fuck, I forgot his name. But that, that, that one on Netflix, that movie on Netflix, it was kind of like a spiritual successor to Braveheart. Very, very good movie. And they had the church in there where the big like slaughter happened. It might look like that. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking pretty pretty standard uh, classical church design. Bunch of pews. Uh, and you got your, then you got your section up here. I'll, uh, I'll, 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 rather than go with the typical Catholic and Orthodox way of, a, of an altar, I'll probably put like a pulpit right up there with the word of God in the center. Uh, that's the that's the Protestant in me. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Although I just realised that this is in the way, quite spectacularly, of the entrance. Huh. You know what? Not to worry. I think I'll make stairs that go to here. Yeah, yeah, I can do that easy. I still have the tower foundation. Go to here. So, da, 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 da. Like so, although I'll keep this open. So I'll be a little bit more suspended. Um, I'm trying to remember. Yep. work. Lovely, lovely, lovely. There we go. That works spectacularly. So now I'm gonna, oh uh, yeah, Christendom Weekly hasn't happened for a little bit now, um, because I'm thinking in hindsight this was probably the worst time I could start the Christendom Weekly, and for those who don't know, it's my weekly little news summary and commentary of church affairs in Australia in particular, although I do, maybe one day we'll go to international stuff if it's big enough and affects Australia. But, um, basically because churches are, well, according to the, the tyrants in our state, churches are not allowed to meet, and so a good majority of churches and pastors are forsaking their duty according to Christ and not meeting. So by extension, there's not really much, if anything, actually happening in the church in Australia today. So I don't really have anything to, to report on, anything to discuss. 
which is unfortunate. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's pretty much that. Um, yeah. Oh man, I'm a bit tired. Ooh. Excuse me. Oh yeah. <sighs> I think I had a late night. Pilgrim, the situation in Australia sounds really dystopic. It is, it is, and I'm living it out. It is genuinely dystopic. Um, but it's also very enlightening. Um, it's shown us what, who in our lives as Christians we can't rely on and who's actually faithful and who isn't. And uh, it's a sad but unsurprising reality that the vast majority of churches, in my, in my humble opinion, in Australia simply are not faithful um, because they've caved into the state either out of fear or even enthusiastically. And that's the worst part about it. Many churches are enthusiastic about not meeting in order to in order to get brownie points, say, look at me, I didn't spread my COVID, I didn't spread my, my virus. So, yeah, it's really shown us that, in my opinion, most churches, um, yeah, they're not faithful. Simple as that. Which is sad, but it's a reality. Yeah. Um... Yeah, that works. How is this shaped? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it's a bit odd. But uh, I, think, I think that might work. I don't know, just a random aesthetic thing. Then it kind of opens up into the church. I might, I don't think I'll even do this. But yeah, awful stuff happening in Australia. Awful stuff. Awful, awful, awful. Hey, Silhouette, my man. How are ya? Glad to see you, my man. Glad to see ya. Mm -hmm. Hope your day's been well, my dude. Hope your day's been well. Oh, man. Pilgrim, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, even Christians in Australia are pretty secular. You'd be right. You'd be right. Um, that's... Large, for the large part, that's the case. But even among Christians whom, before this COVID season, you would think are quite faithful, even if a little bit normy, um, many of them have faltered. Many, many, many of them have faltered. Uh, so it's not surprising for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It isn't surprising for me, but it also is. It's not surprising, but it's also very disheartening. But, um, as I said before, also very enlightening. It's shown us who are really faithful and who we can rely upon in times of persecution. Um, and who to mark off as apostate, in my humble opinion. Because what's coming up now is that, in my state, once 70% vaccination has been reached, so 70% of my state of New South Wales, once that's been reached, then there'll be a partial reopening that... It only only extends to the vaccinated, all right? So we're going to have a proper apartheid state, a proper apartheid population in Australia. Um, and that includes church gatherings. So church gatherings will only be open to a certain capacity and only for the vaccinated, officially, according to the government. So once that happens, and that's going to be happening as early as next Monday. So, oh, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. It's happening tomorrow, I think. Um, then there's going to be a brief period between that and 80%. 80%, everyone will have the same rights. So unvaccinated will also be able to go to church. So it's not going to be a long window, but it is going to be a key window that I'm going to be watching to see um, because now churches will be faced with the choice of... Because um, here's the thing, they, they can't fully enforce it either. They're actually relying on businesses and churches to enforce vaccination passports themselves. So it's very likely, and many businesses have already said they're going to be doing this. They're going to just let in vaccinated, unvaccinated people and not report it. Simple as that. Um, so unless a cop is walking by and decides to check everyone for no reason, there's not going to be any consequences, um, except for the obvious fear that comes when this starts out. But now it's going to be the ultimate test for the church in Australia. Um, it, it, cause it'll, it will be as simple as this. And that's my position that I'm going to die, that I will, that it's a hill that I will die on that. If you're a church and you turn away people who wish to commune with the body of Christ, uh, because they do not have a government mandated vax passport, then I believe you're apostate. You are not. You are an enemy of Christ. You are directly opposed to Him. 
you have regarded Caesar, you have regarded the state as your God. You are not, you are not a church. So that's something I want to check out. I do want to, how would I say it? Check out some churches. And uh, given my status, um, officially I will not be able to attend them. But I want to see, um, thing, I want to see if, for example, they will allow me, someone who has been deprived of communing with the body of Christ for close to half a year now, um, I want to see if they will nonetheless um, extend upon me the Christian invite to come commune with the body of Christ. And if they say no, I'll be able to say, understood, I know never to come to you again and to warn others that you are a false church. Simple as that. So that's going to be the big test in this window. I really want to see this happening. I want to see people going, I want to see other people. Anyone else in Australia, if you're watching, do the same as me. Go to churches, whether your church or other ones. If they don't let, if they don't let you or someone else you know who's unvaccinated in, then they're a false church. I don't know how else to say it. Can they be forgiven? Of course, they can be forgiven. But that assumes that they will turn from that way, that they will repent, um, which is a different question altogether. If they do, fantastic. If not, they're a false church. Leave them. They're, uh, yeah, you, you, you can't get good. You can't get good fruit from that church. So yeah, big test. Big test coming up for Australia. And that will definitely make some good episodes of the Christendom Weekly once we get to that stage. Ah, oh, far it's difficult to... What am I going to do here? I think I might make some wooden pews. Yeah, I'm going to do wooden pews. Although first... Do I want a cobblestone floor or a brick floor? I'm trying to think. Cobblestone or... Probably cobblestone. Why not? So now we're going to uproot the floor. <laughs> or rather the, the dirt, grass, ground. And get some cobblestone. Oh, man. <clears throat> uh, Jeremiah says, maybe tell them first what is their problem with kind words first. If no change, then do what is best. Yeah, yeah, perhaps so. Although, uh, I don't expect the, uh, the security guard or usher at the door to be in a position to speak for the pastor's decision. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I can request to, before I leave, request to speak with their pastor. Um, and then if he doesn't change his mind, then I'll say, okay, you're a false pastor. Have a good day. <laughs> That's, that might be a good idea. I might actually do that, Jeremiah. Thanks for that suggestion. It is a sad state. Um, oh, Jeremiah also says, because if mainstream telling, not all will listen... But if one to one, uh, that would work. So, so what do you so what do you mean by that mainstream telling? Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. But but even even if um, I, I don't know. You, you just clarify what you mean by that, um, and then I'll then I guess I'll reply. I need to get more stone. I need a lot more stone. But I also need to make a lectern. So you know, I'm gonna do that. How do I make? I'm gonna get a recipe. Uh, Minecraft lectern recipe. Oh yeah, that's easy. Too easy. All right, I can do that right now. Because I actually ended the uh, last episode with making a sugar ca uh, sugar cane farm. So now I'm going to have a steady supply of paper and of books. Uh, not necessarily books, because you need cows for that. Because you need the leather. And perhaps once I get that lectern, once I slap the lectern down... Oh, come on, really? But once I slap the lectern down, then I... Um, then I'll probably, uh, I'll probably get ready. I'll get some preparations for the nether happening. Why is a flipping library? Yeah, okay, I can't do it right now. That sucks. Look at that though. It doesn't look too shabby. I've got to complete some stuff with it, but it's not looking too bad. What do you guys think? It's not looking that bad at all. I can envision it right now. It's going to look pretty decent in my opinion. Let's get some more stone. Because I can't make a lectern, which is unfortunate. <clears throat> 
English grammar, Jeremiah says English grammar die right now. Hold on. Usually it would be we would talk about this online or in general, put up a vid. How have you directly? Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, a hundred percent. I, I, when you when you mentioned that initially, yeah, yeah, that that would, um, that would definitely work. I'm not I'm not intending on making like a direct video response to a specific church, but um, I might list them out. I might go around survey them, um, and if they turn me away, then uh, yeah, I'll I'll mark them off. Maybe I will comment on them. Uh, publicly, but otherwise, before that, before I leave, yeah, maybe, maybe I can converse with them one on one. And if they're still adamant, sorry, we're not going to let you in. Um, yeah, then I'll I'll mark them off properly, fully, as those to avoid. Jeremiah, a particular church, one one talk that would be better IMO, but it takes a lot of work. It would take a lot of work, but I'm totally down for that. I'm totally down for one to one discussion with a pastor who's otherwise turning away uh, members from the body of Christ um, because the state told them to including members who have been deprived of meeting with the body of Christ for months on end, um, which I'm sure even he would admit is spiritually detrimental, as it has been for me, very, very spiritually detrimental. And I've only ever... Um, I'm only still sane right now, I'll say this, I'm only still sane and not in a massive blood rage against our leaders because of brotherhoods and friendships I've had with uh, with men around me, both uh, pro hardcore Protestants and some tra traditionalist Catholics. Um uh, yeah, no pastors in my life. I've had to rely on my man, on my friends. Um, although I guess if you count overseas pastors who are nonetheless not my pastor, to a small degree. Um, although, yeah, I haven't had uh, any major pastoral help. Um, but my brothers have been there for me and it's been great. They've, they've been an immense help. Um, but yeah, it just shows that there's, there's, it's not always the pastor. Often it is the pastor who's saying to his church, right, we're not going to meet because daddy government says so. That, that pastor is, ap that pastor is apostate. Um, but then sometimes it's out of the pastor's hand because the vast majority of the congregation may well be taken on by the hysteria themselves. So the pastor can't meet because his congregation won't meet. Um, my friend gave me that consideration a while ago, one of my friends. And uh, it's true, it's true. We've got to remember, it's not just the pastors, guys. Lay people are... Arguably, even more susceptible to the to the lies, to the evil being spewed out by media and by the government, which is sad, very very sad. But ultimately, the onus is on the pastor. If he doesn't open up, then he's exposed the apostasy of his church. In a not so related note, I'm actually thinking as well. I might occasionally stream uh, Stellaris. Um, if any of you guys have heard of that, I think, I think you guys should know what Stellaris is, a sci-fi grand strategy game with a heavy emphasis on customization. So you can customize what your empires like, your ethics, names, um, what, what kind of government, uh, you'll have. It's really, really fun. Really, really fun game. Um, and the role play LARPing potential is, uh, is limitless, <laughs> highly limitless. <laughs> so I might, I might do a bit of streaming on that. Maybe create the, uh. A space church, a space theocracy, and uh, spread the rule of God to aliens all over the galaxy. <laughs> Ooh, Pilgrim with the spicy one. Do you think theistic evolution, do you think scripture is compatible with theistic evolution? Uh, if theistic evolution is proven to be true, then yes. Um, I ultimately take Genesis to be chiefly allegorical, not 100%. Um, yeah, like for example, I believe there was a real, like specific Adam and Eve. Um, even if the details of the story um, even if many details of the story are allegorical, I don't think theistic evolution necessarily contradicts it. Cause I like, I do like to think of Genesis as kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like the bedtime story that, uh, that dads would give to their children. Um, cause the children simply doesn't have the, the categories to understand the full state of the world in its full truth. So dad would abstract things, allegorize things in a bedtime story. Um, that's how I think it was. I think God gave us the greatest bedtime story ever told, uh, with Genesis. And I think that's, I think it's compatible with a more literal view as well. Even if you were to take, uh, um, young earth or old earth and six day creation or, or just creationism in general, intelligent design, perhaps no evolution. I still think, uh, I still think, a allegorical reading of Genesis makes sense. So don't take me as saying allegorical Genesis, therefore evolution. I don't. I genuinely think evolution is dubious on scientific grounds. Um, and so I'd side more with the intelligent design uh, community, not necessarily six-day creationism. Um, but yeah, um, other than that, regardless, um, yeah, 
That's 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 my position, if I may put it. If sloppily, if I put it sloppily. Don't have any water. Great, great. Oh man. Oh, whoops. I wonder um you're a you're a catechumen, you said Pilgrim. Um uh, Pilgrim says, I was thinking the same until I realized almost all church fathers, even Augustine, taught it's liberal. Uh, I haven't done a survey of the church fathers myself, so either way. Um, although I guess that's where the, epistem uh, the epistemological grounds between us uh, would differ. Whereas you would take uh, at least what you would, con you would conceive as the unanimous or majority consent of the fathers. Whereas I would say that... Um, it is at least theoretically possible that most fathers could be wrong on something. Um, and I think it would make... I don't think uh, that would pose too much of a problem here, given that... Um, how would I say it? Just the means of being able to conduct science on the origins of humanity and of the earth and all that. Um, they simply didn't have those means. So I guess... So I think it's, it's reasonable for them to just assume that Genesis is more or less literal. Um, although even then, as um, there are those who take more of an allegorical stance on it, um, so yeah, can't exactly be, can't exactly be ruled out. Um, I, I believe ultimately, cause look in the end, in the end, these church fathers for the most part did not have access to what would be the ancient, uh, texts that basically define the context of ancient Israel, which are, which is very critical for us to understand, uh, the, the full meaning and intention of Israel's scriptures. Um, so yeah, so they didn't have, they didn't have access to that. Um, for the, for the most part. Sorry, one second. Hang on. Gotta mute myself. Sorry, just had to chat with my brother for a second. Um, thing, but yeah, they they simply they simply didn't have access, as far as I'm aware, they didn't really have access to like say um, the various Babylonian, Sumerian, Akkadian texts, among among many others, um, which help us define the cultural context of Israel, even the literary context of Israel, and how certain literary conventions work, and thus allowing us to see uh, how the full extent of the meaning and intention of, of the Hebrew scriptures. And I believe, I believe that in light of such context, we can see that they intended, uh, their creation stories and including Israel, uh, to have a more allegorical sense. Um, e either way, whether regardless of that, I think that holds more or less universally for the Hebrew scriptures. Um, and I'm not saying that they're, I'm not saying that every church father is an error or whatever. I believe for the most part, the meaning of the Hebrew scriptures is plain just from reading the scriptures themselves. Cause in the end, they're still using human language talking to other humans. Um, but in many instances, in other, many other instances, and even some pretty key instances, some instances in my experience, um, there are some key things which, which we've only been able to really unearth, uh, recently, thanks to the discovery of other ancient texts, which helped define the boundaries of literary context. I reckon one of the biggest ones, one of the big, big key ones, in my opinion, has been with our, uh, in light of relatively speaking, recent uh, discovery of uh, of the nature of ziggurats and other texts that refer to them in a certain idiomatic way as reaching to heaven. Um, and to summarize it, you can read, you can look up the work of this OT scholar John John Walton. I have a I have his book where he describes this just in my library over there, and uh, his basic argument. His basic argument is that in the literary context of the ancient Near East, um, the, 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 the statement of reaching heaven didn't actually refer to literally tall buildings that would touch the clouds, but rather specifically to the ziggurat. And what a ziggurat was, it was actually a distinct structure from a temple. The temple would be where the gods would reside in it during the sacrifice, during the, during the rituals and all that. They perform the sacrifices. God would enter the temple, possess the idol, all that stuff. But how the God would come to earth in the first place 
was actually through the ziggurat. That structure was considered a thing that would reach to heaven. It was basically the bridge between heaven and earth. And so in light of that, in light of that context, um, it's very, very likely, almost certain in my opinion, that the the sin of Babel was not simply that they were trying was not that they were trying to build a super tall structure that would touch the clouds necessarily and thus that would make them powerful somehow. But rather actually their sin was that they were trying to bring earth down to them. I mean heaven down to them, down to earth, through the ziggurat and thus control the gods, because the ziggurat would be how the gods would come into earth, come into the idol and give the people all their goodies as long as they sacrifice the right stuff. Um, so basically that's that's why that's why um, the that's why God would say in Babel, if they do that, then they will then nothing they will be all powerful, nothing can stop them, so to speak. Because that's how the ziggurat worked. It was basically their means of bringing down the gods and manipulating them in a certain way for their own benefits. Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't think any church fathers pick up on that. Um, simply because it was out of their reach. It was out of their reach. Um, uh, well, just archaeologically speaking, these texts have only been discovered very recently for the most part. Um, I don't know if any of them... So yeah, as far as I'm aware, as far as I've seen, none of them really point that out. I'd, ha- I'd be happy to be corrected, but I'd be shocked if any actually did know that because these are very recent discoveries. Not to mention that they didn't have the internet, they didn't have telecommunications, they couldn't exactly go to Google Earth and look at a ziggurat <laughs> in, uh, and, and find out exactly what it did. Um, yeah, so that to me is very interesting. Actually, I'm going to bring back up my chat. I had to use my phone for something else very, very briefly. Um, so, yep, coming back and we are live again. There we go. Oops. Oops, let's hit play again. Because I'm watching this on my phone as well to make sure everything's good. Um, yep, cool. Everything's sweet. Everything is sweet. Let me check my computer as well just to make sure. We all G? We all G? I think we're all G. Good, good, good. Just had to do something briefly for my brother. But yeah, um, so circling back to the original thing, that's why I believe that a simply appeal to most or even all fathers as saying something, um, it can be evidence for it, but it's not decisive. It's not decisive. And it, I, 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 yeah, I think that's just very plain. It's not necessarily decisive. Um, text still can be understood by other means, both in the text themselves, um, but also in other non-ecclesiastical writings and contexts that we find. Um, so yeah, that yeah, basically my long winded way of saying the church fathers didn't have ev- did simply didn't have all info with them. And so, um, they couldn't have a perfect interpretation, um, of all scripture, which are based. So that's basically the, the foundation of my, uh, what was I making again? Yes. Pickaxes, um, of my different foundation to that of orthodoxy, for example. Um, Andrew says, do you have any other siblings, Paul? Are you close? Yes, yes. One brother, one sister. And we're close. Um, my brother more so. Sister lives away, so not as much contact. Um, and Pilgrim says, I think that's where we differ. Yeah, yeah, 100%. 100%. Become Protestant. <laughs> become, become Protestant. Andrew, begum, begum, brothers, begum. Yeah, there we go. Cool, cool. We've got a floor. We have got a floor. Now, question is, how am I going to do the front? I think what I might do... Jeremiah, begum. <laughs> yeah, the boys. I might elevate the front. Just a touch, just a touch. Yeah, it actually works quite well. So this would be where our 
our blue jeans, uh, uh, soy latte sipping, uh, cool hip pasta guy will be preaching from. <laughs> this is where he'll be from talking, talking about, uh, talking about how to do ministry on TikTok. <laughs> That's what we'll be doing. We'll be inviting, uh, pastor Stephen Furtick to take over this beautiful Celtic church. <laughs> That's what we're doing, boys. You've fallen into my trap. I am actually a normie Hillsong-like evangelical. <laughs> well, I am evangelical, but I'm more I'm Hillsong-like. <laughs> You're falling for my for a classic blunder. <laughs> and Pilgrim says I was almost becoming Lutheran. I was almost becoming Lutheran in the early days of my conversion. Lol. Damn, man, you should have stuck with that. Should have stuck with that, bruh. Should have stuck with that. <laughs> Andrew, lol, no, not Furtick. Yes, Furtick, bro. He's leading. He's he's leading the Christian antif antifida. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah Hillsong by your cowards. <laughs> I was joking there, but I actually was attending Kil uh, Hillsong until relatively recently, so beginning of the year. Um, but yeah, I still well, I still call myself Pentecostal. Um, yeah, still Pentecostal myself, although with reformed leanings, of course. So yeah, Andrew says I think blue jeans were based. <laughs> based? Based on what? <laughs> oh, I thought blue jeans were based. Past tense, bro. No, no, no. Go back to present tense, bro. Blue jeans. I don't think you guys know this, but actually, the only the only priestly vestments that Christ Himself ordained were blue jeans and uh, short sleeve shirts. Facts. Straight facts. Jeremiah. Uh, wait, Furtick is not Hillsong. He is Elevation Worship. Or something. He is, he is. But like, yeah, they, they may as well be the same thing. Oh, Silhouette Dikit. Semper Ubi Sububi. Semper Ubi Sububi. Silhouette, did you just... Did you just do what I think you did? I'm so glad I didn't say that out loud. I mean, it's not it's not rude or anything. It's just one of those silly things where someone gets you to say something without you intending to say it. Semper ubi sub ubi. Uh, in literal translation, always wear underwear. <laughs> My man, that is so stupid. But I love it. <laughs> Pilgrim, based on the Apostles' Creed, of course. Of course, of course. Of course. The Blue Jeans epidemic was actually caused by the Apostles' Creed. So this is what people are going to walk into. They're going to see this. There's going to be a few rows of pews here, which I can actually make right now. Um, yeah. And uh, they'll be they'll be ready to listen to some Hillsong United as soon as they walk in. <laughs> uh, Calvin. Calvin 300. Hi. Hello, Calvin. How art thou? That is a very good name to have there. Calvin. I love that name. I absolutely love that name. Very base name, in my opinion. In my humble opinion. Alright, so that means... Uh, the pews aren't going to be that big. Jeez, uh, not big at all. Actually, I'm moving. It's only going to be a small church. I'm not thinking of anything grand. Actually, I might even... I might even push this back a little bit. Why not? Jeremiah says, I've never heard a sermon from Furtick, so I can't see if he's right or wrong. Eh. I mean, look, most of his sermons are like just the, the normy, pent charismatic, evangelical stuff. So, not harmful, but not very enlightening either. Um, although I have seen accusations of modalism. Um, uh, so, I, I, wanna, I do want to check that up. But I do suspect, as, as often it is the case, they're not consciously modalist. It's just that they're so imprecise in their language because they're not well trained in theological parlance um, that they say modalist things without intending to say modalist things, among other heresies. Um, so yeah, that's what I suspect that may be. But uh, yes, we are making Le Pews. I think three rows may be good enough. Yeah, yeah, three rows are good enough. I mean, hey, again, this is a pilot season, 
and pilot season means that it's not it's not like the full thing you know the full true season one for upon this block will be making something grand and i'll be more or less regularly uh inviting friends on uh to join me uh talk talk fun cool church and bible stuff um yeah yeah andrew says pepe le pews ha ha laugh track La laugh track <laughs> yeah this is the basics of the interior ladies and gentlemen so you walk in bang you know what you know what I'm thinking as well do I have the iron for it that's the question I don't know I don't want to reveal my power move just yet but you know what you know what we are gonna go to the cabin we're gonna go there and we are going to get some stuff what stuff you might ask you'll see I'm not going to reveal it straight away. I'm not going to reveal my absolute power move just yet. Uh, let's drop those, drop those, drop that. And those, and we're good to go. So we're heading back to the cavern, into the mine. I need to get some iron. No pillages around, that's always good. Let us hope I didn't jinx myself. Mm, but yeah, and I mentioned towards the beginning, so I mentioned my um my new discipline of monthly study of a certain topic, super in-depth study on a specific topic every month. And that this month is the quarter decimal uh, controversy, and that I do intend, I likely intend to make educational videos out of these topics that I study. So I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna start organizing like playlists for uh, classroom education type videos um, in which I will, well, give education on specific topics. Um, I know I've, I've, I've educated myself and been educated in plenty of topics already. So that's, so I can already do a bunch of them without these monthly study things, but it may be a good way to tie it together. I'll pick a topic to study, make a video on it afterwards. So yeah, my first, so my first like proper educational video will be on the quarter decimal controversy. And I'll label that as uh, ancient history, church history. Um, and I think in the thumbnails, I'm trying, I'm trying to find the actual cavern, the actual deep cavern that I found, not this small one. Oh, and we got pillages. I jinxed, of course I jinxed myself, of course. Flipping course of flipping course, and my shield's almost broken, so I'm not going to be able to. I am not going to be able to fight them. So they're just kind of chilling over there. That sucks. That sucks a lot. Hmm. Do the cave here. Maybe I can. Maybe I can delve into there. I was gonna hope that they don't come my way. Anyway, anyway, educational video on the quarter decimal controversy, um, and I'll tailor it especially for classrooms from secondary school all the way up to university. Um, and the key selling point will be, um, well, for one, just how straightforward and simple it is objective um, but also provide all the necessary primary sources so that students of history and of religion can do their own research um, so they don't have to simply take my word for it because one thing that's always greatly annoyed me about the good majority of history channels um, when they do educational videos is that and it's not to say they're necessarily erroneous but they just simply don't give the primary sources um, to allow people to do the research themselves and become educated so they really, in my opinion, in many ways, they're useless. Unless you're just having like a casual interest in the topic and you're not interested in researching further, um, then they're fine. But videos that are otherwise aimed at proper education in like the classroom, for example, and they don't cite historical sources, um, it's, it's just useless to me. So I want to do that. All my educational videos will be with that, especially with history or primary sources referenced and extensively quoted. Um, so I'll do that with the quarter decimal controversy video 
And yeah, and all my other future videos. So I hope it will be good. And of course, it'll be the same with my other long form videos, like my one against the Christian statist ideas. Um, all good, all sources used will be properly cited and attributed so that you yourself can go. I'm going to stop this. So you yourself can go and find it out yourself. <laughs> oh, crap. This is precarious. And all just to find a little bit of iron. Pepe Le Pew's laugh track. Is there any iron? Of course there isn't. Because 1.18 is definitely going to be much harder with mining now. Because um, all deposits aren't uniformly dispersed anymore. There's going to be areas where there's pockets of iron. There's going to be areas where there's jackal. <laughs> So I might have to leave it later. Okay, I might, I might as well mention it. I want to put a cauldron right at the inside entrance of the church. Basically the, basically the area where you dip your hands in for holy water. <laughs> as you would see in Catholic churches. Although in this case you would just dunk like your full body into it. Because that's how Minecraft works. You can't exactly extend your hand and just do a little dip. Oh man. But now we must sleep. Hmm. I'm definitely going to do that next time. Um, I originally intended um, to have like kind of like a list of the basic things that I'm going to do and accomplish in the game um, every episode so that I'm not going aimless. I need to get back onto that. And I don't even have my bed with me, so I need to steal someone else's bed. So I'm going to do that next for next time. Get back into that. Make... Uh... Make basic, oh man, basic lists of what to do, um, yeah, just to accomplish and all that throughout the episode, but also not just that, but specific plans, like how to do this, um, yeah, so I'm not aimless, maybe even have a little bit of offline time on this game so I can just find everything out properly. Pilgrim, how many languages do you speak? Technically just English, although I have a fair amount of knowledge of ancient Greek, and I'm wanting to get back onto that at some point to get to a conversational level. Um, and right now I'm full steam ahead on Latin. Uh, also in a conversational Latin, uh, conversational level. Um, although I've had a little bit of a high hiatus on it just because I'm trying to get busy with my uh, college work. Oh boy. Wait, do I not have a stair roof somewhere? Oh, I might have only done it for one bit. I'll, I'll try and complete the roof. Why not? We can at least do that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much that. It's, just, it's pretty much just scattered knowledge across, uh, well, across ancient Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Um, yeah, sadly not proficient, I would say, in any of them. To, not to the point where I'd say I'd buy or multilingual or whatever. Which sucks, um, but I'm going full on with Latin, so that I can say that I know Latin. I can speak Latin, read, write, hear, and all that. Uh, I want to get to that stage. Uh, and then eventually I'll go back to ancient Greek, master that. And then back to ancient Hebrew, master that. Um, Pilgrim, only ancient ones based? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Modern language? <laughs> that's cringe. What, you speak Spanish? You speak Mandarin? Bro, that's actually cringe. <laughs> Imagine not speaking the language of your ancestors. <laughs> My ancestors are smiling upon me, Imperial. Can you say the same? <laughs> 
my ancestors. That's something you hear from the pagans a lot. <laughs> the neo-pagans, who are a thing today, people. Don't be mistaken. There are neo-pagans to this day. My Odin. <laughs> Ooh, that's an idea. I could do that. Ooh, that could look pretty nice. Okay, okay. Stare, come on. <laughs> Exians killed my ancestors. <laughs> or maybe they just weren't tough enough, mate. Get good. <laughs> get. <laughs> I say to that, get good. <laughs> It's funny because they'll often, they'll often also brag that, oh, look at us, we killed these Christians at this event. <laughs> we're stronger, we're better. And then once the Christians do the same, oh, they're oppressing us. <laughs> supposed to do that either um it's not gonna look that bad once i once i get it done do, 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 do. yeah i need more stairs that's why yep why well, yes i deliberately take full damage in order to traverse the terrain how could you tell I'm, just, I'm trying to be the Chad. Uh, so Louette says, A lot of Scandinavian neo-folk songs adopted from ancient pagan poems. Heresy, but interesting. Yeah, yeah, historical interest, I reckon. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Pilgrim Odin would take care of Theom first if he learned his modern worshippers are a bunch of soy boys. <laughs> I don't get the reference, but I'm sh I assume it's meant to be funny. Stuff. I'll just do normal corner. I was intending to do like stone fence gates, uh, stone fences as the corners, but I'm thinking it's just going to look ugly. So I'll just do that. And we need more cobble. But for now, I definitely need to refine the shape. This is only this is definitely very very basic in its look, but uh, it may get better. I think. Yeah, not too shabby. Not too shabby. <sighs> I'm thinking. Look, I think I might call this one slightly early. I might call this episode a little bit early, just because it's not normal time. I had to change it up. So not as many people, I guess, could make it. Um, but also, there's just not as much direction I have at the moment. Not as much stuff prepped to be able to do anything in a meaningful length of time. So I think what I might do, I might finish up a few things here or there. Um, but then I'll call it for this episode. And then in the week, I'll check out the world, try to scout things out. Be much more clear with where things are, what I can get, how. Uh, and then have specific like pretty much have a specific itinerary um, for exactly what I'll do in the episode just so I can keep going at it consistently, make consistent progress. Because um, right now there's really there's really nothing I can do in any meaningful time for the rest of this episode. Um, but even then, we made some good progress. Hey, we've got a basic interior here. It's looking, it's quite definitely looking shapely. I, again, I want to put a lectern right here in the middle, so it'll be very, very nice. Um, probably get some big arch-like windows as well for along here. Basically more decoration and definitely have to decorate the front a little bit more. Um, I'll do more, some more, do some more research on that with uh, Celtic churches. Um, 
And then I wasn't able to do nether preparation today because that will probably also take a decent amount of time just to get some basic stuff. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'll probably do some offline things just to put a few insignificant pieces here or there. I don't want to do anything offline that's major and significant. So no building, no building, but maybe resource gathering. Um, and then on the episodes, that's when I do the main stuff. Um, yeah, so that's what, that's what I'm thinking of. And, uh, I guess, uh, is there anything I need to finish off here? I mean, not, not, not particularly much that I can do. Um, actually, no, I guess I can take this cobble and just finish a couple of details for the corners. And uh, yeah, sure, man, it's Sunday anyway, so take it's Sunday anyone, so take a rest anyway, so take a rest. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So normally I shouldn't be doing this, but uh, there's no churches meeting, at least none that uh, that I can get to, so I can't um, observe the Lord's day, so to speak. I can't gather for corporate worship. So, uh, yeah, I just have to, I just have to stick with this. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm just going to patch up a couple things and then I'm going to call it an episode. And, uh, before I do fully call it, I'll do a nice little plug as I want to do consistently. Uh, staircase. Yep. Wunderbar, wunderbar. All right. So I think you can see what I'm going for with this shape. So the, the tower is slightly indented in, which I think is a, it's a nice little detail touch. And uh, it's of course very difficult to actually tell <laughs> the shape that there is an indented tower just because of uh, the nature of the, the, the shadows, but also there's lacking details. So maybe I'll add something so you can perceive the depth a little bit better. Um, actually, you know, maybe I'll expand a little bit of the wall out here and yeah, maybe that can work. I don't know. Either way, look, I think this has been a not too shabby episode. Not, not, one, of, not one of the greatest, simply because it's a little bit ad hoc um, and uh, my lack of organization has kind of caught up to me. So I, so I think, I guess this will be, this will be me calling the episode. Um, but of course, before, before I call it, I am going to uh, just give me one second. I'm going to switch. Is there a way to lock? Um, is there a way to lock on so that I can change something without? Um, I, I guess there isn't. Uh, camera side plus window. So ah, perfect, cool. Um, so let me. Nope, nope, no, not meant to do that. Make it a half window and perfection. Okay, so I'm going to do what I usually do and plug my Patreon. Um, actually, you know what? Patreon slash the other Paul. Oh yeah, that's right. I need to go to the public page. Um, but yes, if you are interested, if you enjoy my content, if you believe in my mission for educating the uh, body, the body of the faithful, um, and uh, yeah, basically helping us to become self-sufficient in our faith in uh, what we know and all that, um, then do consider becoming a contributor. Uh, my good friend here, Andrew Bailey, who's here in the chat with us, he is my first ever patron. So big congratulations to him, a big thank you. So I'm going to give him a shout out because that is indeed one of the one of his rewards. That is I my eternal gratitude. Um, and I well I shout out my patrons. I give them a big thank you in videos and of course in proper formal edited videos all patron names will be listed at the end of it as a good way of saying thank you and uh, this is all in Australian dollars by the way so if you're in the US for example it's actually quite significantly less than all these so I reckon it's a pretty decent bargain in my humble opinion um, but yeah different reward tiers give you different well, rewards um, do consider contributing if you believe in my mission believe in my ministry so that's my plug um, Andrew says you are doing the Lord's work bro I am happy to support it thank you very much my man that means a lot means a lot to hear from that. And I, I really enjoy these encouraging comments I do get from people, even on my Facebook, for example, saying, bro, you help, you help me understand this or you've been really educating me on that. And uh, it means a lot. So if you want to see, if you want to see this all become more consistent, 
higher quality and even just greater volume in general of good content, consider becoming a patron. I can, be, I will more or less be able to make this a job. Um, even while I don't have, especially while I don't have teaching work for now, but even when I do become a proper high teacher, I'll uh, still be able to do this alongside it. Um, and yeah, so do consider becoming a patron and, uh, thank you all as usual for coming on to watch upon this block. It's been great. It's been great. Even if, uh, not the best, most organized episode, not to mention because of the timing, but, uh, seriously, thank you again for all coming along. I really enjoyed it. I hope you all enjoyed it as well. All those who came along and, uh, yeah, I will see you. Oh yes. I'll quickly update as well. I do. Even if, even if I have to grab something from another country, I will do another episode of Christendom weekly. Uh, this week because I do want to make it regular even if there's not much happening so I will do that uh, my jurisdiction of the state video is full steam ahead right now with the writing of the script um, and the research so that will be happening it still may be a little bit off but it will be coming and it will be an extremely useful resource that you'll be able to post whenever you see someone say oh Romans 13 obey the government in whatever bloody bloody blah, blah wear a mask and all that bull crap uh, you'll be able to throw it at them and say here's why you're wrong but more importantly, more importantly than that, you're not just relying on my video. You will be able to follow the evidence that I give in the video myself and come to an actual uh, real knowledge of that evidence yourself. So you yourself will be able to argue for the truth without having to simply appeal to me as a secondary source. Um, yeah, but seriously, thank you all again for coming along. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, God bless. God bless you all. Love you all.